Hello everyone, it's Bubbles, and welcome back to another Siege panel reaction trailer. Hmm, hang on. Strike that, reverse it. Welcome to another uh, Siege panel reaction. Uh, we're, we're reacting to the panel on the upcoming season for Siege. I believe that is going to be Year 9, Season 3. Um, we have a new operator coming, and it is about time I watch this, because... I've been hearing rumors about a disabled operator, somebody who's in a wheelchair, which obviously that uh, there's a lot of questions, especially because I'm imagining that they're going to be a defender, which means they're going to be on site. Um, so I'm very curious to see how this is going to work. Um, leave a like, leave a comment if you're also confused on how this is going to work. Um, I'm sure we're going to discover everything through this video, though. Um, but yeah, and I'm hoping this new season is going to be interesting. Um... <laughs> I'll be honest, Siege has been bombing me out just a little bit recently. Um, probably more community problems than it is the gameplay itself. But yeah, I don't know. Just hoping for some good things. Um, but yeah, let's 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 see what they've got for us. <sighs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Operation Twin Shells. Sorry. I'm Camille Salzar Hadaway, and it's time to hear straight from the developers themselves all about Year Nine, Season Three of Rainbow. I don't know if it gets says, said enough, but Camille, you look fab. I don't know. I don't know how many panels I, I have. Has she been the the head like the the intro person for every panel we've done so far? I'm pretty sure she has. Maybe not the first one. I don't know. Point is, you're looking great, gal. Siege. This season brings an innovative new operator and a versatile new weapon. Let's kick it off with an overview of the season from Creative Director. New weapon. That's that's curious. I didn't know about this. I don't know a lot of things, to be totally honest. I know that the just like to disclaim what I do know, there's a new operator who I believe is meant to be in a wheelchair and I believe is meant to be a defender. Um Solus is meant to be getting a rework. That's probably about it. Oh, I've heard the R4C apparently getting some changes. Um, but yeah, beyond that, going into this blind. Oh, and Jaeger's getting a new skin. That's at the end. I'm not super interested in it, so um, probably not going to buy it. I don't, the problem is that Jaeger doesn't get enough playtime out of me. Um, plus, I already have some really good cosmetics on him. So, I don't know, it's the double-edged sword. Dr. Alexander Karpazes. Oh, come on, Lexi. Year 9, Season 3 is all about Operation Twin Shells. But okay. Just straight off the bat, I'm really happy that with the, the blowjob cam in the back. Now, if you don't get what I mean by that, <laughs> that was one season <laughs> where he just sat there and it was like, he was like man spreading and it was like the camera was just like down here, like near his legs like as though we're, we're about to go in for some kind of porn scene i don't know <laughs> just it was, it was a weird camera angle um which made me giggle but hey whatever before we jump into that it's really important that we acknowledge that well, am I, we heard am I from you it? I don't know. and we haven't met the expectations that you had for operation new blood and we want to reinforce that we are dedicated hang to on what did you say we heard from you and we haven't met the expectations that you had for Operation New Blood. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm I going to address that because I see... <laughs> I see where some people have some complaints about it. So Operation New Blood, obviously, that came with the recruit rework. And the way they handled it was rather than keep them as recruit themselves, they announced two new characters called Striker and Sentry. They have the ability to run two secondary gadgets rather than running their primary uh running running a primary gadget which i actually think is a really cool thing cool feature but the problem is that there's just some elements that they feel like they add together really weirdly i, I don't know maybe maybe some gut elements too because they're very restrictive restrictive with the gun pool that you got for those characters which would make sense if it was a normal operator but because we're talking about recruit I feel like there should be a little bit more flexibility. At the very least, attackers should have DMRs, defenders should have SMGs. Um, I don't know. There just needs to be a little bit more option. But yeah, I, d I didn't mind it too much. I, I haven't mind recruit, um, striker, or sentry. And we want to reinforce that we are dedicated to this game 
and that we are putting more resources than ever into it. And you'll start to see that with Operation Twin Shells. Operation Twin Shells is all about the new operator as well, Scopos. This is Kiri Galanos, who's one of the original operators from Rainbow Six. And she comes with two shells that she can control. Well, this. There's our wheelchair, I suppose. It's not bullshit. <laughs> there, there is a wheelchair operator now. Is a testament to the creativity of the Holy game. Holy mother and the of God. talent of our team to come up with unique operators like this that are still game changers. I We're thought that was just armor binder. Okay, right. To anti cheat and anti toxicity, which is a major priority for us for the future of the game. And we have more like the Siege Cup coming in beta phase. We also have balancing changes. We have After Action 2.0 coming online. And we have so much more for you. We can't wait to dig into it. So let's begin. <laughs> I've got so many things I want to say. I, you know what? They're not bad changes, but I just, I know deep down that like this, the, sorry, I just, I, this season I've, I played a couple of offline matches and every time I go on, I have a terrible experience with teammates. Um, doesn't matter if I'm having a brilliant day with, with hitting my, hitting my shots or whether I'm having a shit day. Um, there's always somebody who's not playing for the team, there's playing like an asshole, is being an asshole on comms. Um, sometimes those people like try and get alt, alt accounts just so they can, you know, keep doing it once the first account gets burned. Oh, I don't know. I, I want to be optimistic, but it's, it's difficult. Um, but hey, the new op looks cool. Um, I'm guessing you can control the robots. I don't know if that means the wheelchair is going to be on site or if, what do they call this? Scopos? Scopos? I don't know. I'm wondering, she may not be on site. That, that's the other thing. But again, I, I'm picturing this is going to be a defender based on the way her gadget works. I imagine you have those two deployed robots. Oh, pardon me. Two deployed robots on site in different areas, so you can like switch between the two of them. Again, obviously, there's a lot of assumption with that, but I think that's the way it's going to work. Let's talk about yeah, let's an see. important topic right off the bat. Cheating and toxicity are not just concerns for you; they are critical issues for us as well. Yeah. To address I, this, we've I've seen a bit of cheating this season, but toxicity it. It's weird. It almost feels like it's it's gotten worse, and I, I don't know why. Maybe maybe a lot of the nice players, casual players, are just gone because this last season didn't introduce much. So I don't know. I, I don't know what it is, but it just it seems more prevalent. We've restructured our team to dedicate even more resources to these challenges. Now to share exclusive details and updates on the current and upcoming player protection projects. Here's Alexander Carpazas and product owner Lancelo Seiji. Guys, I don't think I'm gonna be. We want to sold assure you that we have more than just one security system in place. More than just BattleEye, we have six detection systems running at any given time, so that we can catch cheaters. And we're constantly improving these systems. On top of this, we want to talk about a pillar as well for our anti-cheat, which is binary hardening. Binary hardening is the act of obfuscating and making it harder for cheat makers to access the game. Think of it like a giant library where a cheat maker right. is trying to find a specific book. For us, we'll be trying to change that book's location as much as possible. And even on top of that, changing the shelves and the entire library so that it's as confusing and as hard for a cheat maker as possible so that in the end, they cannot effectively make cheats for our game. Am I imagining things, or did did what he say said not make any sense? Like I I get the whole analogy of moving shit around, but what what is the thing that they're looking for in the first place? The the exploitable thing? Are they just are the code going to shuffle around? Yeah, is it like a server based thing? Like it's it's going to make it difficult to. <laughs> get into one thing because it's going to be bouncing. I don't know. That didn't make any sense. I 
please comment if you understand what that meant, because I didn't. Like, I, I get some of it, but I, I just, uh, I think I get where he's trying to go with that, but I don't get how that is a thing. But yeah. When it comes to Siege Cup, for those that have won and have cheated, they will be banned. But of course, their teammates will have access revoked from Siege Cup as well, ensuring that competitive integrity remains in Siege. Another area of improvement Good. is time yeah. to ban. 75% of bans are happening 12 hours sooner now. And this is something that we'll be working on in the future to reduce that time as much as possible. Good. As you may have seen in our- I'm not gonna say names, um, but there is one person who I am hoping got a fat fucking man because I just, I, I kept getting them in my matches one sesh. I was, I was, again, I, it's it's what puts me off of streaming it because I I know any length of time or a few hours that I play Siege, all it's gonna take is just a couple of really shit sour teammates, um, to really ruin the experience. Um, so I've I've been doing a bit of offline stuff, just grinding here and there, just get some, try and get the battle pass stuff done. But there was one guy, I just, I swear, like, I, I'd wait to try and not get in his lobby, and I'd still, every single time, wind up in his lobby with his mate. He, his mate would TK me a lot, and he'd just chalk massive shite. Um, but yeah. I don't know. I just, I, I'd like to think that they got a fan. I'd like to think that they, you know, that there'd be sanctions against both players, but it, it's, it's difficult. Like, obviously, I'm going to have to see how this goes, and I will try and stream before this season goes into play. I'll try and stream once this season goes into play. But I apologize that there hasn't been much gameplay on Twitch, on YouTube recently, uh, and that is the reason why, is I'm just a little bummed out with the players I get in my seed matches. Um, and if I, if I can't play with friends, then that's kind of, I'm rolling the dice with whoever I get. <sighs> so yeah. I guess update for anti-cheat, the team has grown in size. It's now a multidisciplinary team that is actually one of the largest in-house anti-cheat teams in the world for any given project. And for us, that means we're totally dedicated to making sure that Siege is the best it can be when it comes to anti-cheat. In the anti-toxicity team, our mission is simple. Ensuring a safe space for all players. Lancelot. That's a name. Lancelot. I like you. In Rainbow Six Siege. It means protecting the community from recurrent and highly toxic players Good. while rewarding recurrent Far positive closely. behavior. Our mission includes handling features like reverse friendly fire, Texas censorship, reports, abandoned penalties, match cancellation, commendation system, and of course, the reputation system. Our philosophy centers around three key principles, transparency, understandability, and clarity. In its current state, the reputation system has some weaknesses and is not trusted by the community. This is why we decided to overhaul it. It means reviewing its structure, the action that are feeding it, and the in-game UI. And to be clear, a single negative action will have a minimal impact on you. Only the recurrence of this action will affect your reputation. We aim to give you access to those changes in Yana in S4. The system will remain in beta. It means no impact and standing until we are 100% confident it meets your and our standards of transparency, understandability, and clarity. Additionally, we are still working on some very impactful features that we cannot wait to share with you by the end of the year. When you finish a match in Operation okay. Twin Shells, things are going to have a brand new look. I'm glad to see there is work look. going on. Please welcome senior game designer Vladimir Kozik to walk you through the new post-action report. Plus, game director Joshua Mills is here to talk about boosting the abilities of your drones. I think I know what they're going to go for here. That's going to be some kind of... Because other games, they'll be like, oh yeah, this person with the top fragger, this person was the the support player, this person did the most of this, like, I'm scared though that what's gonna happen is, if they do this wrong, it could be really sabotaging to players who don't perform so well, it can just be really 
I don't know. I I'm hoping this is going to be mostly a positive thing where it really rewards everyone and makes everyone feel a bit better. In new season, we are introducing post-action report in a completely new dimension. Instead of operator cards, there will be a new screen with teammates represented as 3D operators located on the same map they just played. Here they can command teammates and opponents. On the next screen, instead of sequence of separated tabs, all progression like crank, clearance, battle pass, also including challenges this time, will be comfortably organized on a single page layout that highlights the most important information. I'm so excited with this update. I can't wait our players try it out and share their feedback with us. Okay, not what I expected, but hey. Drone boost not is a new feature coming to our attacker lineup. The goal here is to continue to reinforce our attackers, make sure they have the tools to get the job done. Intel is king in siege and keeping your drone alive is crucial to getting that intel. Some of the changes we did to Solus helped with that, but we want to go further. We want to give more power to our players, specifically the attackers. So drone boost means you can actually boost your drone a maximum of three times, three seconds per boost. You can cancel it mid boost to quickly evade, quickly close distances, and each boost once expended takes six seconds to recharge. So the boost resource system is actually kind of similar to Maverick's Torch in the sense that you can cancel the action at any time and it doesn't fully deplete the boost. So you can cut up a boost as needed, but again, you'll only have three full ones. Drone boost isn't limited to just the default drone. The clutches from Bravo or even Twitch's drone can also take advantage of this feature. If Mozzie happens to get his hands on one of these drones and there's still charges left, so that's the key factor here. If there's still charges on that drone, now they're Mozzie's to use. So the future of drones in Siege is really focused on their economy, which means making sure they can survive oh, longer, okay, or at yeah. least giving our players the ability and the tools they need in order to make sure their drones can survive longer. They should be used more regularly in the middle and late game of the rounds, and we want to make sure that you have those tools in your arsenal to be able to make things happen. It's good. I know a lot of people were pissed about the solace changes, and, and I know there's probably more coming that I don't know about because it was a two-parter. This is meant to be a second part. <laughs> but I think it's a lot of people are underestimating how strong defenders are right now. Uh, obviously, there's a big rework overhaul going on, trying to like target all the different defenders, make it a little bit more balanced. Um, but like a big part of it is that um, attackers are supposed to try and use their stuff to get intel and figure out what's going on. And unfortunately, defenders have too many um, blanket... Um, not nurse. Blanket counters to intel gathering um, that are just way too easy to do, way too hard to counter, um, make people just want to rush in and forget about droning. Um, Encouraging droning, making droning stronger, uh, making counter to drones weaker. That's all really, really good. Always positive. I mean, unless, of course, they do something broken, but all these changes seem really good. If you like competition, this next update is for you. The new Siege Cup beta is coming this season for select players to test their five stacks in intense tournament play. A new... Disclaimer, probably not going to test it. Um, knowing how much uh, Siege didn't want to let me access the marketplace better, I've got a feeling they're not going to let me into this one. Um, so, you know, just sorry. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I don't have anything else I can say. The reward that. system is coming as well for both Siege Cup and ranked matches. Plus, a few more interesting updates that live content director Christopher Budgeon is going to tell you all about. In Year 9, Season 3, Operation Twin Shells, we're happy to announce the beta of Siege Cup. We made the decision to restrict Siege Cup beta to the PC platform because we can be much more reactive. If something happens with the Siege Cup, we can address it much faster than with other platforms. We really want to launch Siege Cup in its full form in Year 9, Season 4. Competitive integrity is imperative for Siege. That's why having a beta to make sure we can register the squads, formulate the brackets, distribute the reward. I was, I was wondering how this was going to differ to 
ranked. I, I'm just, I'm noticing here the way that like the maps are working and I'm guessing it's very similar to how competitive, like you do like a map ban phase where this team bans this one, this team bans this one, or at least that's how I would hope it works. Um, I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> um, and then like, I suppose you got like your different teams. Um, yeah, I don't know, this could be fun, yeah. Data to make sure we can register the squads, formulate the brackets, distribute the rewards. We have to get it right. To register your team for the Siege Cup beta, follow the QR code or the link that you see on the screen. Just pausing it. If you want to scan it, do it now. And get ready for news about the first Siege Cup coming your way. With Siege Cup, you have to register as a five stack meaning that you have to bring four of your friends, get ready to compete until the tournament is over. Once the Siege Cup starts, you're there committed to the Siege Cup to play until you get eliminated or of course win the tournament. We see the Siege Cup beta as our most competitive playlist, even more so than ranked, because the stakes are extremely high. The first Siege Cup will be near the beginning of Year 9 Season 3, and after the finish of the first tournament, we'll run another every two weeks for the remainder of Year 9 Season 3. In Year 9, Season 3, we're introducing a new currency called Competitive Coins. Competitive Coins are exclusive to our competitive playlists, that being Ranked and Siege Cup. Get as far as you can within the ranks, as well as play as many Siege Cups as you can to get Competitive Coins to open these exclusive packs. In Year 9 Season uh -huh. 3, all console players will receive one free competitive pack. Move up the ranks, get as many competitive coins as you can, so you can continue to open packs in that collection. Starting in Year 9 Season 3, when you're waiting for your next match, whether it's in Ranked, Quick Match, or even the Siege Cup, you'll be able to enter the shooting range to stay warmed up, ready for your next match. Additionally, we've also added a cover feature within the aiming lane. Now, you can have covers pop up from the ground, dummies will hide behind them, and take position as you try to eliminate them as you warm up your aim. Both PC and console players will be able to enter the shooting range during matchmaking. 1v1s cool. have become more popular within C. I I never really use those sorts of features, but maybe it's something I should look into. Um, but oh my gosh, it, it is a great thing seeing that the devs have these thoughts on their mind. I don't know. Each. And that's why we've now added a 1v1 custom preset oh in custom game. There are two presets for 1v1s in custom game, short and long. The short preset allows you to play six rounds with four rounds to win and one overtime round. In the long preset, it's the first to eight rounds, but if the match gets tense and it's really tight, there are three overtime rounds. In both of the 1v1 presets, all maps are available. The prep phase has been lowered to 20 seconds. It's perfect for one player to get set up and ready for the attack. The bomb game mode is the featured game mode in both 1v1 presets. Roll swap every round. You play attack, then defense. This will continue until whoever finally wins the match. With every new season, the question arises, which operators will be targeted for balancing and how will they change? I, again, I know Solace is on the chopping block. I know Dokubi is on the chopping block, or at least it's meant to be. I would love if Mute could be on the on the block too. And I know that that's probably a big ask, but I just, I feel like, and, and the thing is, I love Mute, but at the moment it feels like Mute does way too much. The fact that he can both jam um, electronics, like drones and stuff, and he can deny walls, and he can just, he, he, he does way too much. I, I feel like he needs to at least lose one of his jammers maybe. But yeah, we'll see. Game designer David Perpignan has all the answers, plus spoilers, it's Solus, Dokubi, and Noke. Ah. Well, <laughs> I guess there's that. Uh, Noke, right. Or Noke, as I often call her. Hmm. Wonder if this is gonna be a buff or a nerf. We are implementing the second round of changes for Solis. We know that the, our previous package was uh, a bit harsh. We've been monitoring data uh, just to see that everything went well. What we've seen is a decrease in ban rate and also in presence, but an steady trend on win rate. 
This new wave of changes for Solis is based in three pillars. The first pillar is the detection mechanic. Now Solis will use only the center of the screen to detect the gadgets, and those gadgets will be unidentified. You won't know what they are. The second pillar is the scanning or identification mechanic. Now we call it overclock, and once you trigger the overclock, your energy is refilled, and you'll be able to see every gadget in the center of the screen as identified. You, you'll know what they are. Aside from that, Solis will emit a warning to every observation tool in the enemy team within the range of detection. So they will know that you are overclocking and that you are seeing their gadgets. The third pillar is the energy access. Now Solis spec IO will last longer and will require less energy to be activated while reloading. Also, these new changes give us more balancing levers that will help us adjust solids in the future. Yeah. Searching for electrons. Oh, 100%. This is what I was thinking was going to happen with Solus all along. People were so scared that Solus was going to be nerfed and that the first stage of it was already too harsh and whatever else they were going to do was going to be way too much. This is always the way that they needed to handle Solus. Give it enough... Um, difference from what it was originally such that it is an ongoing process it's been described as a part one part two balancing situation but it's realistically part one was enough to like just stop her from do over over dominating everything part two is the rework side of things that they wanted to spend longer on to make sure that it was working quite well and it's going to be an ongoing process from now on. I don't think people should consider this as the end of her rework. It's just, it's it's now going to be a more evolving, small tweak ch kind of changes. But yeah, we'll see how this works. I like this though. Doc Ivy right now can generate a lot of pressures in defenders, specifically at the beginning of the round. That's why yeah, we're Doc taking me. a look to the resource management in her ability. Now, Doka will start with zero charges, at the beginning of the round and we'll get one every 45 seconds but only up to two per round these changes should reduce the pressure on defenders now they should have more time to prepare their setup and doca ivy players will be encouraged to survive longer to have a greater impact in the match global abilities like doca ivy's logic bomb have a great impact in the game and so i i don't think this is a bad change i just i <laughs> Considering they left Dokabi till <laughs> season three, even though they they highlighted her as a problem in the year in in the season one panel for this year, it just it feels like a very small change that probably could have been implemented a lot earlier. Um, whether or not they weren't even thinking about Dokabi at that point and they were just mainly focused on Fenrir and and uh, Azami, that that could have been it. <sighs> but I don't know. I just three seasons to come up with this seems like a very extended amount of time. But yeah, whatever. I like I like the idea of this. This this seems like a reasonably fair way to handle it. Sometimes with little effort from the players, we are aware of this and we will take a look at it in the future, being part of bigger changes for the game. Yeah. See you around. So knock is receiving a buff. We think that camera scrubbing and intel deception is how stealth should look in Rainbow, and that's what Nock does. The changes we are making are affecting how Nock's ability consumes energy. Instead of being time-based, they will be action-based. That means that some actions like walking won't consume any of your energy, but if you sprint or shoot, your energy will be consumed. These changes aim to make Nock more patient. We want Nock to be better at flank watching, cutting rotations, and increasing the uncertainty on defenders. We want them uh -huh. to feel like there's a monster in the house. Knock and Smokes, FMG9 is getting- <laughs> Oh my god, that was a f <laughs> That is- <laughs> I'm not saying I've got good recoil control, but that was like a woo! Like, did, did a complete, like, full circle around his head before shooting it. Getting above. We are reviewing its recoil to make it more comfortable when you're shooting at longer distances. Specifically, when you're using Hang on, what are they doing? Are they to up? make it more comfortable. Knock and Smokes, FMG9 is getting a buff. 
we are reviewing its recoil to make it more comfortable when you're shooting at longer distances, specifically when you're using magnified scopes. The objective of these changes is to improve the player perception and balance of those operators while keeping the frustrations away. There will be more changes in this season. For example, we are taking a look at the proximity alarm and its synergy with Sentry, and also at the delayed timer for explosions on the Claymore. A big update for Versus AI is coming in offer. Delayed time of the claim wars. I don't, I don't really get that. I, I think the um the century one is quite helpful. <sighs> okay, we might have to play knock a bit. I um I, I do like me some knock. It's just I when it comes to me playing siege, I tend to gravitate to characters who are supportive, who try and help like i i don't focus on being the main fragger so much as helping my fraggers get in there and know what's going on getting rid of obstacles letting teammates know about things they might not have realized um occasionally throw being a gridlock or a nomad or something to try and make site more workable for us or to make blanks a little bit harder to get i don't know knock might be worth visiting and seeing what i can do with um so yeah I don't know, we'll, we'll stencil that one in. Operation Twin Shells. As you'll now be able to play as a defender and face off against a squad of attacker bots. For more, here's AI programmer Ariane Montreal Delaire. I probably won't use this next bit, but I uh, this, this Versus AI it. is a game mode designed for new players to provide them with a safe environment where they can learn and practice before their first ranked experience. In year 8 season 4, we introduced Versus AI for the first time. Since then, we keep adding more operators to play with and against, more supported maps, and we keep integrating more AI behaviors. This season will be significant. We're introducing Versus AI 2.0. Given that Siege is an asymmetrical game, we want to give the players the opportunity to play the other side. For the first time, players are going to be able to play the defenders against a full team of AI attackers. The AI attacker team will feature five operators, Ash, Thatcher, Termite, Nomad and Sledge. As a defender, the player will be able to choose between 16 operators in- Ash, Thatcher, Termite, Nomad, Sledge. Right, so one, one dealing with flanks and the rest of them pretty much are all breaches including the new one, Scopos. New players are going to have the opportunity to learn how to react to those attackers' behaviors, but it will also give them some ideas of how to play themselves when it's their turn to play the attackers. Both beginner and advanced game mode are going to offer the full match experience at launch. Similar to a casual game, the player is going to enter as either a defender or an attacker against a full team of AIs. They're going to play on one of our eight supported maps, and after two rounds, they're gonna switch sides. We've heard your feedback, and we want to make sure that Versus AI gives a real feel of what it's like to play Siege. Okay, here's a question for you. And, and th this is one I wanna to dedicate to the chat as well, um, or comments or whatever. Would, so firstly, like this is more to Ubisoft. Is the plan to eventually have it so that you get if a player disconnects from a lobby you get an ai replacing them until they can find a player to fit in if it's like casual or if it's ranked just a an ai to try and fill that gap um and secondly would you want that as players would you want to have a situation where you get a replacement teammate that's just ai and uh what would be your thoughts on that? I'd, I'd love to hear it in the chat because I, I um, Dead by Daylight has recently been tinkering with a lot of stuff and anyone who knows me knows that I'm primarily a Dead by Daylight player. So I don't know. I'd be curious to see because Siege is a lot more competitive and I'm curious to see what people think about the idea of getting a teammate to try and even the odds because obviously they won't be perfect, but would that be preferable to going in without that teammate? I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. It's now time to talk about the new operator, okay. Scopos. This Greek defender this brings a new dimension of tactical possibilities to the fight through her twin shells, Talos and Colossus. For insight into the visual design of I this like operator, it. we'll hear from art director Joanna Sui. And for a breakdown of the new gameplay opportunities she offers, we'll go to game designer Justin Laranje Alualia. 
they they mentioned that she's meant to be kind of like the old god of siege sort of thing, which I'm noticing like because didn't they do a similar thing with Deimos as well? It feels like they they're really leaning into establishing the history of Rainbow with these most recent operator releases. But yeah, just really curious. I'm noticing. Scopos is from Ravenshield era, and okay. her name is Coris uh, Galanos. Her visual uh, design is really based off- <laughs> That just confused me so much. <laughs> I, I, was waiting, I was waiting for this girl um, to explain to me what this new operator is going to do, and just all of a sudden I've got this weird animation of this. Okay. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I don't even know why I find this so funny. Okay. Uh, just that look. Okay. Right. Okay. Show me what's going on. Scopos is from Ravenshield era, and her name is Coris uh, Galanos. Her visual uh, design is really based off of her um, story background um, and the trauma that she went through. In the anime that was released from the Year 9 Season 1, in the mission, uh, there was Daniel Bogard and uh, Jared Morris at that time trying to stop the bomb maker. In the end, you uh, see a giant explosion, and it was actually exactly that moment where she stopped being able to walk. Ever since then, she's a wheelchair user. She's been in a relentless chase, trying to seek prosecution to stop Deimos. All that toll took a effect on her face. She looks very gaunt. She has eye bags, wrinkles, and wear and tear. Scopus uh -huh. is a master strategist. I, she reminds me of somebody, but I can't, off the top of my head, come up with it. I don't know. If, if you guys have got some comparisons, I'd love to hear them, because she seems very familiar. But the problem is I've been watching The Walking Dead recently, and I've got a feeling that's really shifting my focus away from characters. A little bit Ruby Rosy, actually. Like, hair-wise. I don't know. I don't know what it is. She reminds me of somebody, though. I have eye bags, wrinkles, and rare and tear. Scopos is a master strategist. Uh, she adapted her wheelchair into her command center like a pilot seat. She uses the shells to be part of the action. In game, you can hear her, you can see her face when you swap between the two shells. When we're designing her uh, wheelchair and the robots, we really had in mind to make sure that she feels very grounded. So we went uh, with analog, old technology look. We really want to establish the fact that it's not smart AI robots. They're not invincible. They can be destroyed. Uh, when she loses Talos, Colossus, she's losing a part of her again. So for the design of the robots, um, we wanted to differentiate the two so you can identify them easily on the field. The difference are in the antennas, the shoulder pads, and colors and patterns are distinct to one another. We made sure to have well, I am really curious to see how these customize. Have the analog look by physically having buttons that you can push. They're, they're wires that you can see and they're not touch screens. They're not holograms. They are something that you can touch and feel. Back when she was a field agent, Kyure surveyed the area from afar as a sniper. Now, she still watches from a distance, but in a different way. Thanks to her new tech, Scopos is able to maintain a wide network of control unlike any other defender. That's because what Scopos brings to the field is not one, but two remotely controlled robotic operators. These shells, named Talos, but two unlike right. any other defender. That's because what's- So is she on the field? Is that her? I'm a little confused. I- Hang on, I, I probably need to just watch. Scopos brings to the field is not one, but two remotely controlled robotic operators. These shells, named Talos and Colossus, make up the V10 Pantheon system. At any given moment, one of Scopos' shells will be in an active state, where it functions like an operator. 
while the other remains in an idle oh, state. Oh, so the, the, the view we were looking at before wasn't her, it was one of her bots. It's like a powerful piece of defensive utility. Scopos's control allows her to swap the states of these shells, quickly delivering offensive or defensive power where it's needed most. Scopos's active shell works much like any other operator. It can move, shoot, and use gadgets. It's also Scopos's primary lifeline. If a shell is destroyed while it's active, Curie's link is severed, and she's functionally dead for the rest of the round. Two bodies does not mean two lives. Meanwhile, Scopos's idle shell will take on a defensive posture, deploying an integrated shield that functions much like a deployable shield secondary gadget. While in this state, the idle shell can be used as an observation tool by Cure and her allies. Additionally, Scopos can access her idle shell's camera directly at any time with the gadget button. While Scopos is looking through her idle shell's camera, she'll have the option to swap shells. Activating the swap sequence will put her active shell into idle mode and put her idle shell into active mode. The only catch is that the active shell needs to be in a position where it can deploy its shield to perform the swap. Scopos' HUD has an indicator that'll make this easier. In fact, Scopos' HUD will display plenty of useful information about both shells, including whether the idle shell is under attack or being affected by an EMP. Scopos is a very tactically oriented operator that requires players to collect data and quickly act on it to maximize her potential. A strong Scopos player is one that makes frequent use of her idle shell to guide the actions of her active shell. For most players, Scopos will likely be a shallow roamer, operating near the bomb site while having the means to extend into a deeper roam or fall back and anchor as needed. If used strategically, she has the power to be one of the most mobile operators in the game. Scopos' idle shell can be a very strong piece of utility. Having the combined properties of a deployable shield and a bulletproof camera, this shield can offer a large amount of intel from relative safety. Scopos' idle shell is most effective when placed in key areas for the defenders to hold so that it can provide information and serve as a launching point for when the enemy least expects it. Tano's coming out. Scopos is bringing a brand new gun to Siege, the PCX-33 Assault. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to digest all this. <sighs> I love it. I love the idea of it, but I, I'm, I'm just... Okay, so it's not two lifelines. I'm tr that's what I'm trying to get around. Is it only that if they if they kill the defensive shell, like the one the one that's currently crouched and making a shield, does that does that kill Scopos? In fact, Scopos's HUD will display Plus's HUD by Cure and these does not mean two lives, and she's functionally dead. If a shell is destroyed while it's active, Cure's link is set. Okay, so if the shell is destroyed while it's active, so that's when you're in control. That is better. That's that's useful to know. So if you think that you're in a position where you're going to die, you can quickly shell up, switch over. Uh, I'm wondering if they got individual health states. I'm like, uh, that that'd be something I'm very curious about. If like if I'm like one health as one of them, go into defensive mode, and then would the other mode have the same health or what? I don't know. That that would be something curious. Okay, I dig it, I dig it. Scopos is bringing a AR. brand new gun to Siege, the PCX-33 Assault Rifle. Cure may not be bringing a sniper rifle into battle, but make no mistake, her shells are still packing some serious firepower. This weapon is precise, deadly, and heavily customizable, making it a versatile tool for a versatile defender. For a sidearm, Scopos carries a P- She doesn't have alternate options for the secondary or for the primary, by the looks of things. Kind of a throwback to Curie's days in the Greek Special Forces. Scopos also has access to secondary gadgets. These are shared between her two shells. Her first option is impact grenades, a great choice to maximize her mobility and roaming potential. Yep. Alternatively, Scopos can bring proximity <coughs> alarms. These synergize great with her idle shell, helping her know exactly the right time to take action. Hmm. The Pantheon shells are two health, two speed operators having been built for a balance between durability and mobility. Given their unique nature, Scopos' shells have a few special interactions. A good rule of thumb is to think of her active shell as an operator and her idle shell as a gadget. The first interaction you might wonder about is EMPs and gadgets that target electronic devices, like IQ. 
While scopeless shells are electronic, the active shell has an active countermeasure that protects it from anti-electronic effects. It won't completely stop them, but it will prevent Scopos's active shell from being fully disabled by an EMP. This protection doesn't extend to the idle shell, however. But does that mean IQ can see the active shell? Again, this is all going to be stuff we're going to have to test proactively, but I just, you know... Question, questions worth asking. Disabling effects will prevent Scopos from using the camera and swap features. Scopos's greatest counter is Dokubi. The hacker's calls are a threat to any roamer, but they also block Scopos's strongest escape plan. Yeah. Additionally, Dokubi's universal hack can give her team access to the idle shell's camera. Brava's clutch drone can overheat Scopos's idle shell. However, this takes a while and gives Kyure a warning on her HUD. If she's fast enough, Scopos can swap to activate her countermeasures and prevent the overheat. In addition to being an electronic gadget, Scopos's idle shell's shield can be destroyed with explosives and similar effects, leaving the idle shell exposed for an easy kill. The glass can also be shattered, preventing allies from fully benefiting from its utility. A well-placed ash charge, frag grenade, or florist drone can make quick work of an undefended idle shell. The biggest threats to Scopos are her direct counters, so she benefits greatly from allies who protect her from them. Catchers like Jaeger and Wamai can protect her idle shell from explosives, and other denial gas. I does yeah. I was already thinking this is the the key when I'm playing. I'm hoping I'll, I'll be able to play with Seb and Soy and stuff. Uh, the key is going to be whoever's playing Scopos. Uh, works with somebody like this, like Wamai, like a Jaeger, to just stop that idle shell from getting screwed up. Um, I'd imagine Mute would also be useful. I don't know. Well, we're going to have to see. We're going to have to see. Gadgets like those from Mute, Mozzie, and Tubrow can stop many of Scopos's greatest enemies. Being made of metal, Scopos's shells can't benefit from healing effects. He mentions Tuberau. Tuberau, the way Tuberau disables everyone's gadgets, so I'm curious if that's going to also disable. Under oh, no, this again, it's I keep saying these questions, but they're only going to get answered by playing and figuring it out. Um, but yeah, will Tuberau fuck over the Scopos? Doc Stims, Thunderbird's Kona stations, and Rook's armor won't help the shells. They also can't get put in a down state, and they don't breathe, meaning they're immune to toxic effects like smoke and Fenrir. That last fact can open the floor to some aggressive combos. Uh, four eliminated. Another strong approach to Scopos is to double down on intel. Maestro, Valkyrie, and Echo can offer more insight into enemy positions and even provide some distractions. That can be more than enough to let Scopos get into position and go for the kill. Scopos is designed to embody the key aspects of being a defender, gathering information and swiftly responding to attacker strategies. Scopos brings a level of adaptability that, if left unchecked, can turn the tide on even the strongest of attacks. We'll be keeping a close eye on her in the test server and throughout the season to see what players can do with her. Loading the map. I know this is meant to be a reaction video and I'm just kind of sitting here not reacting, but I just, like... That is, <laughs> that might be the most complicated operator they've added so far. Um, God, that is, that's a lot. But I love it. I, I, I like when Siege goes really out there with these sorts of ideas. Um, and this is, yeah, totally going to make this season work. I, I will be playing this season. I will be playing Scopos. Uh, I'm a bit jealous that she's not already properly in the game now. But it might even, she might even be worth checking the test of. I don't know. We'll see about that. <sighs> but yeah. Okay. I dig it. Um, new, 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 uh, new, <laughs> new weapons means that I, you know, my black eyes is not going to apply to them. But hey, whatever. Small price to pay for a reasonably cool character. You won't see his face ever but you'll probably recognize his voice as he's a big part of the Siege community. It's Marley, and he's here to give you his own special brand of insight into the new operator 
new balancing updates, and all that Operation Twin Shells has to offer. No idea who this is, but let's see. I, I've been digging this special guest thing they've been doing there. First impression of the new operator was definitely, oh, they've broken the game, this is it. But then when you see how it actually plays, it's amazing, it's mind blowing, and it's definitely the most versatile operator on defense. The new weapon she's got is uh, <laughs> another assault rifle on defense. I love it, I love that weapon. The best strategy that I've found was- I, I didn't mention it before, um, but yes, he brings up an amazing point. I did, the second they mentioned AR on defense, I my ears perked up. Uh, yeah, definitely excited about that. The new operator so far is definitely finding my typical mirror window hiding spots on the fence and planting one of the shells in the corner and hoping everybody walks right past it and then switching to the shell when needs be. And uh, yeah, the rest is the rest is history. During the playtest, the hardest counter that I noticed definitely feel like Flores drones yeah. are a big issue. If you're leaving your body somewhere, it's gonna get. I destroyed. don't hate that though. Any anything to make Flores a pick over Ash. Um, because obviously Ash is a very, very prominent operator that a lot of people play. Um, Flores has a lot of the same capabilities, but it just because he's got to take the extra time, he's got to send a drone out. There's been buffs to drones with this update. Um, yeah, that honestly, I, I'm happy that they haven't actually done anything to Flores himself, but just a lot of the systematic stuff is going to make it a lot easier to play Flores a lot more beneficial to play Flores. Um, so yeah, good fun. The balancing changes this season have got me really excited. The changes to Nock are really exciting. I'm gonna be playing her completely differently to how I used to. I'm gonna be sitting under cameras and uh, yeah, really exciting. And I'm glad to see the new Solace change as well. I think that's a great change. Now you'll know when there's a Solace below when you're droning and I think that's amazing. Are oh, the Siege Cups gonna be another level? So ranked is sweaty and fun and competitive. But Siege Cup is going to bring a whole new level of sweat and passion to Rainbow Six Siege that I can't wait for. Who will I want to challenge in the 1v1 custom match? <laughs> what a silly question. Jinxie, I'm ready. Overall, I think it's oh, a God. really refreshing and exciting season. Year 9 Season 3 is bringing what I think is one of the most exciting operators I've seen in a long time. I can't wait to see all the fun and different plays coming I from agree. people. And I just think overall, alongside the balancing changes, it's just going to be a great season and I can't wait for it to launch. I, something I, yeah, something I felt about Deimos was he really was not designed for me. Uh, and then obviously the, the recruit rework, which, you know, obviously cool, but that's nothing overly specky and new. Uh, before that was Tubarau, who he was meta-breaking, then he wasn't. I don't know, he did, he I probably was a bit gobsmacked by him in the in the trailers and stuff, but I, you know, didn't really mean too much to me. Uh, I don't know, it's just, we, we've been through a lot of operator releases that haven't meant as much uh to me personally i and, and part of it might be that you get your fenry as a band all the time um my most recent operator that made me feel really excited about like holy holy crap this is this is interesting and new and different and i can't wait to see how this works um is probably brava like the and it's it's the same idea of a character with a gadget that allows them to really change up the way that Siege is played. Um, introduces a really new element to the game. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm I'm down. I'm down with the clown. And that's the full rundown for Operation Twin Shells, which is hitting the season test server tomorrow. Yep, Jump in good. and see how Scopus, Talus, and Colossus change the way you defend a site. And as always, remember to report issues you encounter while playing to R6 Fix for a chance to earn a tidy reward. Who's better, for your Talos efforts. or Colossus? Now, don't leave just yet, because <sighs> we've got one more thing for you. It's Jaeger in space! Can't wait for this music to get me copyright struck.
It's just, it's the wrong time for them to do a Jaeger Elite. Ugh. And nothing else we missed. It's, I, I, I don't, I don't hate Jaeger, but he, again, is not the strongest, uh, in the world. So there's that. <laughs> but, he literally just got a fantastic Battle Pass skin, um, where he, like, got the cowboy stuff and, and all the rest of that, uh, he doesn't need another skin. Um, not like there are there are other operators like Tuberau and and Solace and stuff that could have really used a uh, unique skin that's that stands out and is different and stuff. Or I'm trying to think who else we've had released. Deimos. Deimos. <sighs> oh well, it's not terrible, but I don't imagine I'll be getting that particularly. Uh, again, I recently got his Battle Pass skin, which was awesome. Um, so, I don't know why they're doubling down and just adding so much shite to him. Uh, in fact, a lot of people say, why, why doesn't Maestro have an Elite? Exactly! This could have been the Maestro Elite. Why, why do we have a Jaeger in space skin? I don't know. I don't get it. <sighs> Whatever. Maybe they're just trying to buff the Jaeger pick rates. Whatever it is, I, I'm going to end the video here. Um, overall thoughts, though, I'd say this was a pretty good um, panel. Let's have a quick look through, see what I missed. Scopos honestly looks great. Um, an interesting kind of op that brings gadget that changes the way the game is played. Like a good, I was, I was saying before, some previous operators, obviously, Deimos is very different. Um, but he's still detection, and Tobarau is anti gadget, and it's like there's still categories that feel very familiar. This feels unique, and I'm excited for it. Uh, player protection and the toxicity stuff always good to see them progressing that stuff, and to just hear them, it's it's not much, but it's it's really meaningful to me to actually hear them address that there is shitty people in their game and that they're really trying to make things better. Uh, some of the private stuff and, and all that, like, it's, it's great. Um, not really interested in it. The stage cups, I'm sure, will be excellent. Um, the drone boosting, nice little buff. As somebody who likes to play Intel Gathering, that's going to be nice for Twitch, Brava, Flores. You know, all of them. <laughs> it's just, it's going to be really, really nice. Uh, I also got some mozzie skins on the marketplace. So, hey, maybe maybe we need to do some more stuff with that. Uh, balancing of Solace, Dokubi, and Nock. Looks awesome. Uh, probably will be trying out Nock at the very least. Um, yeah. We don't know anything about this side of things. Uh, and the Jaeger skin kind of sucks. Because it was on Jaeger. But, hey. <laughs> What can you do? Can't win them all. And hey, if, if the if the skin is a little bit of a disappointment, uh, I'll take it. Um, but that was the panel. And I enjoyed it. Uh, once again, I think that the Siege devs and stuff put together a really good showcase of their ambitions, their direction, the content that they're currently adding, and then giving people a really good idea of what's to come. Um, obviously we didn't get any roadmap stuff this particular time, um, but that's fine. I, I think this was a really good presentation and I, um, yeah, I'm excited for the new season. Uh, and if you are too, let me know. Uh, anyway, I'm going to end here. So see you guys later. Bye-bye. <laughs>